Arteta! What a strike! Stop me if you've heard this before, but an important issue was put to a controversial vote with contentious results. This is the Arsenal Vision Post-Match Podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner, and maybe, just maybe, democracy is a bad idea. Um, I'm not saying it's definitely a bad idea. I'm just saying that, like, a lot of people don't seem really happy with the outcomes of democracy. And whatever your view on the outcomes of elections of various things lately, I think we can all agree that there's a substantial number of people that haven't been happy with those outcomes. And even if you were happy with some of them, I'm sure there were some that you were less happy with. And I think we can all agree, falling into that category, is the captaincy. Um... So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the captaincy. We're going to talk about the five captains, uh, the good, the bad, the hilarious, Ozil. Uh, We are going to discuss the Forest game because it was a delight and there haven't been enough of those uh, in the recent past. So we're going to discuss that. And then we're going to look ahead to Manchester United. The way we're going to do it is we're going to do it first with Tim. You can find him on Twitter at Stobretto. Hello, Tim. Hello there. And then we will take a break, not right now, but down the line, and then Clive will join and Tim will stay on. Uh, So that's the order of things. Um, I will let you know, I don't know if you've heard about it, but there's a sports website called The Athletic, and uh, they're catching on. They they have some young up-and-coming writers who I think are doing some neat work. Actually, there was some great reporting out of The Athletic this week um, that broke a lot of cool stories. So if you want to find out more about that, theathletic.com forward slash Arsenal Vision gets you a free month and half off everything after that. Like, that seems good. And then we get people like David Ornstein and stuff to come on the pod and tell us things. And we want that. So let's all help each other. That'll be cool. The other thing you could do is you could sign up for Patreon. We did a Shaden Freud pod, and that is in no way a jinx. Sorry, people are complaining that I'm saying that wrong. Tim, do you have the correct pronunciation of that in your in your brain? I mean, I, mean, I don't know if it's the correct pron- pronunciation. I say Schadenfreude, but um, I'm famously not a German speaker, so who knows? Schadenfreude, Freddy, Schadenfreude. I've also been told that the way I say Rochdale uh, makes it sound like French cheese, and that is incorrect. <laughs> is it just Rochdale? Rochdale. Rochdale. I mean that. Mm. I like Rochdale. I want to go to Rochdale <laughs> and have a nice uh, Chianti and a and a Roquefort cheese. Um, I just combined a lot of cultures there. Anyway, uh, sign up for Patreon because. Because we love it when you do that. And you can come in the Discord and say nasty things to me and I have to be nice to you. So it's fine. Um, all right. Here's what we're going to do. Tim, let's talk captaincy. And before we get mm. to the people that were named, I, I want to get your take on the decision to have the players vote on this and whether this is really reflective of any issue with Emery or typical Tempest in a teapot. It's difficult, isn't it? Because it always kind of depends on how you feel about the manager. Um, I, I reflect on this quite a lot when this sort of thing happens and, uh, you know, when there's a bit of bad feeling about a manager or results are bad, the kind of things, you know, so certain things they do can be painted as, you know, further evidence that they're idiots. Whereas if they do the same thing during a winning run, it's usually celebrated as like, oh, look at this kind of innovative management style. And, you know, the five captains last year didn't raise nearly as many eyebrows as it has this year because last year it was new and it was different and it was a new broom and a new era whereas this year people are kind of saying what like what is the point in this um and and i think also just because i mean this is one of the reasons i guess i can't get that worked up about it i mean look at our five captains last year like three of them have left and one of them you know you get the impression that emery would drive into the middle of a forest so well hell, look, obviously... look, at, look at our captains any of the years <laughs> before that too they never played yeah they were all you know injured yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I've, like my personal view on it is that it doesn't really matter. And and so I'm, I'm kind of conscious that I, I'm really, really not trying to load um, my kind of decreasing faith in Unai Emery onto this. I just I think it's been made an issue when it needn't be made an issue. If all of this had been done in like July or August, I, I really don't think there's any problem with it. I don't think there's any problem with canvassing the players, uh, particularly via anonymous ballot. I think that's fine. I can't, I can't think of a problem with that. Um, you well, know, don't, I don't, don't you want to confirm it at a minimum that you're not naming someone captain who has like no support yeah. within the group? I mean, that that seems reasonable, maybe. Yeah, yeah, and and look, also, I, I think Jacker was having taken the armband all season anyway. I think it would have caused quite a lot of ill feeling if Jacker wasn't voted. So I, I kind of think there was, you know, not that they were forced, but, you know, I think it was a bit, 
a bit le- like, yeah, let's confirm this because if we do anything else, it, it looks really bad on our teammate and he's going to sit there thinking, oh my God, everyone hates me. But uh, yeah, I, th- I think it's fine to get their input. That the, the issue is how late it's all happened and that is the timeline that makes it look a bit more like just slightly muddled thinking um, again. So... I, I have to say, I just, like I say, like the issue, it, it really, I don't care. Like, I really don't care. Um, but I, I tweeted about this earlier. The thing is, for a manager, captaincy is only a decision you can get wrong. And the reason for that is that it doesn't really matter. Like, when you're winning, when you're winning games and you win trophies, no one says, oh, it's because um, that guy was wearing the captain's armband. No one ever says that. Like, when you're winning, whoever is wearing the captain's armband is not talked about. Jordan Henderson is the Liverpool club captain, which in the ordinary run of things, rightly or wrongly, would be hugely derided. Mm. But it's not. Because they win every week, so nobody cares. And nobody thinks the reason they're winning is Jordan Henderson is wearing a piece of cloth on his arm. So but the problem is that in you know, in a PR sphere, it is something you can get wrong. You can't get it right. All the best you can hope for is that nobody talks about it, but you can get it wrong. Um, it's a bit like working in HR, right? No nobody rings you up and says, Thanks for making sure I was paid on time this month. Because that's just what people expect. But mm. if you don't get paid on time, then you get an angry phone call. And that's a bit what this is like. You know, look at uh, the likes of perhaps William Gallas in the past um, and players like that. Captaincy calls we didn't necessarily make correctly. I, I don't think some of the captains, you know, that were just like subsequently injured, like Mertesacker and Arteta. I don't think people were upset about that. Some people, I guess, found it a bit odd but I think it's clear what happened there. They were important players. They were made captain and then they were injured. And, you know, I, I think that was more, you know, slightly odd for people than it was like a source of anger. The The problem with this, it's been made into such a big thing now, particularly when Xhaka's own place in the team is such um, such a like a source of discussion anyway. This well, that, kind that's, of exacerbates that's the reason. that. Yes. I mean, look, yeah. let's face it, Tim. The reason anybody really cares about this, I mean, that, don't get me wrong. There are some people that just believe in the, the captaincy as an important role and care about it. And if, if you do feel that way, by the way. Which is fine. Yeah. I yeah. I don't agree necessarily, but I am mm. open to, to that perspective. What I would say is that the the reaction to this, I think, is two things. First of all, look, I don't think it's any secret at this point that I have not been Emery's biggest supporter at, at this stage of the work he's doing at Arsenal. Having said that, I think your mileage will vary about this having the team vote on it thing and the captaincy thing in the sense that if you are particularly ready to pile on Emery, you will find mm-hmm. this as another stick to beat him with. And yep. I just think that this is going a step too far to find something to be critical about him for. Like, I mean, I even read an article that said Pemp had a vote about the captaincy. I don't know if that was yeah, real yeah. or not. I saw a screenshot of it. I, I think it was legitimate. Look, um, I think the reason anybody cares is because people want Shaka out of the team and naming him permanent mm. captain suggests to people that he will stay in the team. I have a slightly different perspective. I think he will stay in the team because Emery just continues to want to pick him and believes in him. I don't know that the captaincy means that. I, I think, Tim, is it fair to say that part of the problem with naming a captain is it becomes a leg- legacy position in the sense that once you have it, removing the captaincy from someone is sort yeah. of a hostile and public act, right? So if if Shaka wasn't named club captain, then the news would be Shaka uh, stripped, wildly yep. stripped of captaincy and and huge issue in dressing room as, as Emery lacks confidence in Swiss leader. Like, th- that would be the story. So when yep. you remove the captaincy from someone, you create a story. So it's, it's sort of the same thing with Ozil, I would imagine. You kind of, once someone's in the captaincy group you almost have to keep them there, don't you? Yeah, yeah, precisely. And, um, you know, if Xhaka hadn't got the armband, then everybody would be reading into it, right, that means he's not going to play very much anymore, including the player himself. Um, I I still don't think... I don't think it will happen, like, immediately. I still think he will be manoeuvred out of the team at some point can, once. Can you support that just a little bit with, with evidence mm. other than obviously the fact that he needs to be <laughs> um so i think like why else did emery wait why else did he um palm the decision off why not just do it in july or early august um i also think that 
the way he's structuring the team, I think he has an eye on Genduzi having that role. Um, and quite often at the moment, Genduzi is moving into those positions. He is often the deepest and Jack is kind of moving slightly to the left. It's not happening all the time, but it is happening um, at points in games. And it happened during pre-season. And uh, I, I don't think he's ready to pull the trigger yet, but I, th- I think he wants to at some point. Whether that's, you know, second half of the season, next week, next month, I don't know. But I, I think you're right. I think he'd kind of been, or he'd manoeuvred himself into a position here where he's kind of damned if he does and damned if he doesn't um, with Jacker, which I think is the whole reason the decision was so delayed. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think the fact that it was delayed in this way, um, I think, I, I still think it, it shows that Emery just didn't quite have the faith. And ultimately, you know, they've made it public that there was a vote on this. So, you know, uh, Emery hasn't, unless I'm mistaken, hasn't asked them to keep that quiet, which he could have, he could have just said, look, we'll vote on it, but we won't tell anyone that, Mm. um, so you've got to think that they want people to know that the players voted for it. So I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but that strikes me as a kind of, you know, a bit of a mere culpa. But but you're right. The thing is, but this is the other thing. If and when Xhaka does come out of the team, it's going to be a much bigger thing. Um, but then, you know, you mentioned Ozil there. And and this to me exposes why it doesn't really matter other than in the very specific personal case of granite shaka like what i I know we're going to come on to this discussion maybe this is a segue like what an unbelievably mixed message when you think about it that ozil almost never plays but when he does he's captain all right so i want to talk about this because here's here's what i will say if you wanted to use this this whole captaincy thing as a stick to beat emery with you could sort of build on the narrative that he is not a good man manager, not a good leader of men, that he struggled at PSG where he let the egos run the ship. And I would argue that PSG is not a workable solution for any manager. So I'm I'm loath to pick on him for that. But there there have been claims that he's too player friendly, that he, he doesn't have the, the discipline needed to control a dressing room. I don't know if any of that is true. But what I will say is that the... The decision to sort of let the players vote, pushing off the decision about the captaincy, to me maybe has echoes of worrying about upsetting the, the apple cart, upsetting the players. I mean, on the one hand, he is willing to leave Ozil at home for the Europa League, play him in the mm-hmm. League Cup, and then haul him off. Not play him in a Premier League game against Villa when you're chasing the game at home. Um, but on the other hand, he doesn't have the courage to just man up and say, you're not one of my captains anymore because I don't trust you and I don't like you. So... I think it is a lack of conviction. And I think the same would be true of of Shaka then, Tim, only in the sense that he could have at least said, you know what, Aubameyang is clearly the leader of this team. He's the permanent Mm. captain. Uh, Shaka's still in the group, but Aubameyang has really ascended to a position of leadership and he takes the young players under his wing. He's close to Lacazette. He's our permanent captain. I mean, is is the Ozo thing emblematic of... uh, a sort of weakness, a lack of conviction that we see both in tactical approaches, lineups, and maybe dealing with the players. Yeah, I, th- I think so in one way. But then in another way, I do actually think that Emery is being quite confrontational in a, in a way about a few things, Ozil being one of them. Like at this point, some of the things he's – like like I, I, I have like some sympathy in the respect that I, Ozil is absolutely not blameless in this whole thing. Of course and not. Yeah. the the slide started before Emery got here, um, et cetera, et cetera. Like he is very culpable. And I don't think there are many managers that would indulge him on a regular basis at the moment. But at the same time, I do th- feel like Emery is being deliberately provocative in a few things, you know, like saying he rested him for Frankfurt. Like, you know, nobody believes that. And saying that is pointed and then like taking him off against Forrest when he was playing really well and it was perfect game for him. He had all the space in the world. He had created Forrest six chances, just, the most in the game, the yeah. most of any Arsenal player this season in any game. I mean, how do, how do you feel about that decision there again, throwing gasoline unnecessarily on a fire? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, again, I feel it was pointed. I do. And and look, don't you wish Ozil's body language was easier to read so we could know how he felt about it? <laughs> but then again, like, uh, so on one hand, 
And this is the thing, right? Because Ozil always kind of looks like that. So he really has to go some, you know, to, to look especially um, especially downtrodden and downcast when he's substituted. But yes, he really did. Like his his face kind of said it all. I Yes, I do. I, I feel again, I feel that was pointed. And I, I don't really understand why. Like, I, th- I think everyone knows the situation with Meza Ozil at the moment. And play him and make him captain but then it that really felt like you know he was making a public example of him and it's a bit like I don't really understand what the point of that is at this stage um not least because like it's not even a message worth sending to the club because I think the club have tried to get rid of him (laughs) but it's just proved impossible for really obvious reasons and the club have gotten rid of you know plenty of players that we wondered whether they could um you know except mustafi but you know so it's not even like a, a point worth making to you know quote unquote the hierarchy because they know like they know the situation they're trying to get rid of him as well and they just can't so it it just it just seems like a a really mixed message and it, it kind of feels like at the moment it doesn't matter how Ozil plays that Emery on the yes, occasions that he wants to play him just wants to make this point and it's just a bit like you've been making this point for 12 months now there's there's no point in doing it repeatedly like we all know that Ozil's on light duties and I think a lot of us don't even necessarily entirely disagree with that it's it's just it just feels needlessly provocative which is a weird paradox given what you're saying about like perhaps sometimes the like because with Ozil it's a bit like well why don't you just like Mustafi him just like banish him Mm. (laughs) send him like send him to train with the kids and just never include him you know you've got youth players who can play in those positions that are emerging like but you know what like I'll push back on that just because Mesut Ozil is not Mustafi. He has something no, to offer. No, no. And, and the thing that I think aggravates me about this is Mesut Ozil had a good preseason. You know, if there's one thing I'll say about Emery, he seems to rely on preseason. A lot of times the players who have big preseasons for him come through and wind up playing a lot in the season. It happened to Ganduzi last season. It happened to Joe Willock this season, right? Um, you know, Mesut Ozil had a good preseason, and then he gets attacked by knife-wielding thugs. N- not his fault, as far as I am aware. And that's it for him. And... You know, I think he was good in the Watford game up until the point where he was removed, which was not a spectacular game, but I don't think that was by any means his fault. Um, He had just made a really nice play, actually, right before he got hauled off there. He was sensational against Forrest in, admittedly, a very low-caliber game, but he was fantastic and and gets taken off for no particular reason. Doesn't get a chance to show what he can do in the Europa League. Doesn't get a chance to show what he can do at home against Villa. And the thing that bothers me about it is this perception that he's surplus to requirements and... We don't really know how to manage it, I think is inaccurate because I do think the number Mm. 10 position has been a glaring weakness for this team. I don't think Ceballos is a 10. I just don't. I I think he likes small distances and a partner next to him. Okay, Shaq is not. Torreira is not a a 10 or an 8 or whatever we're trying to use him as. You know, we're not using him right. I think Ganduzi could play there. I actually think if he's not going to play Ozil, I'd play Ganduzi at the 10. I think he's showing that he can be really good closer to goal. But, you know, we haven't been willing to do that. And we're having trouble connecting midfield to the attack. And Mesut Ozil does that, and he showed that he could do that a bit against Watford, and he showed that he could do it against Forrest. And much like the Forrest game will have people saying, well, Martinelli should play more, right? Oh, Martinelli should play more. Look at the game he had. Chambers should play more. Look at the game he had. Well, if that logic holds, then look at the game Mesut Ozil had. He should play more. And I I think I am sympathetic to the idea that, look, Unai Emery didn't agree to give Mesut Ozil 350,000 pounds a week, but Mesut Ozil didn't force anyone at the barrel of a gun to do that. Arsenal did that. That was a mistake, and we should not have done it. But he's in the team, you know, or in the squad. He is talented. He plays a role that has not been effectively solved without him. I mean, Tim, isn't it fair to suggest that the treatment of him now is starting to look like vendetta or, you know, personal? Because he's kept his mouth shut on social media. His posts have been mostly supportive. He had a good preseason. He's played well when he's played. But, you know... much in the same way that Granit Xhaka has glaring weaknesses and they're on display every time he plays, but he keeps getting picked. Mesut Ozil doesn't seem to be able to get this guy back on side. Yeah, yeah. And and you'd say that if, because there might be something going on at the training ground that we don't know about. Of, you know, yes, maybe of course, that's fair. He's, he's, he's not trainer. But, but if that's the case, then don't pick him. Like, if the, you know, is this punitive or is it not? Is he saying, look, you're not coming up to the mark, you're not training properly, 
or like what's he said like again it just it feels a bit like a mixed message and and i'm with you like Ozil is you know Ozil hasn't turned into an idiot overnight he's probably not the player he was he maybe could be i think i don't think there's any like physical reason that he should be such a diminished player um so I, I think he's got to take his share of responsibility for that. But he's not completely useless, like far from it. And, you know, taking him off after 71, like after what, 70 minutes against Forrest? Like, why? Like, he's he'd played about 70 minutes all season to that point. So he doesn't need the rest. Nobody thinks he's starting at Old Trafford. And that game was six days away anyway. So... You know what, like what I mean, other he, reason? He maybe should be, there? but that's a different discussion. Yeah, like like no, none of us think he's getting picked at Man United away. So like, why? You know, it's, that's why it feels pointed. Like it's not like he's protecting him or anything like that. It it just again, it just feels like a point that didn't really need to be made. Um, to be honest, so well, and and look, I mean, again, it, it just drags me back to the point that. Again, you're absolutely right. There are things that Mesut Ozil may be doing behind the scenes that we are not aware of that makes this situation more complicated. But on the pitch, <clears throat> it certainly doesn't appear that way. And if Granit Xhaka can keep getting picked, and Socrates and Luis can keep getting picked, and admittedly that that's sort of by necessity there, um, it's hard to explain why Mesut Ozil can't be. And mm. maybe it's just that he doesn't run around enough. I don't know. I mean, there was that quote that came out after the Forest game where he said about Chambers... Uh, I told him to sit back when he moved to left back and just kind of hang back and protect Saka, but he kept overlapping. He didn't listen to me. And I, I think it was meant tongue-in-cheek as kind of a joke, but I'm sorry, I can't help but hear a guy saying, against Forrest, with a lead, comfortable, I want my fullback sitting back and protecting their their winger. Like, maybe it's just that Mesut Ozil is too, much, too influential in one part of the game and not influential enough in the part of the game that Unai Emery focuses on. I don't know, but... Whatever it is, it, it, it's certainly an interesting dichotomy now because he is in the captain group. Maybe that is just a decision that he wasn't ready to go all the way to making this a, a crisis with the player by removing him from that group. I think with, mm. with Shaka being the permanent captain, he, he avoids controversy if he is thinking of dropping Shaka. At least he's not sort of doubling down on that and, and really hurting him. But, you know, there's an interesting thing. Um, Amy Lawrence wrote a good article for The Athletic about sort of the duality of Shaka, the the player who has errors in him, but the leader behind the scenes. <clears throat> and mm. one of the players who stepped up and really complimented Shaq's leadership, I think was Rob Holding. But I sort of had an interesting question for you about this and about captaincies. We have sort of a split squad right now. We have a lot of very young kids coming through who need a certain type of leadership. <clears throat> Excuse me. And maybe they need that leadership of Shaq, you know, collecting the fines and being on time and, and administering discipline. But we also have some senior players, players like Aubameyang and Lacazette, who've been in the game a long time, have big personalities or big talents, do you think that the kind of captain young players need as a leader is very different from the kind of captain that older players will look up to, players with a lot more experience in the game? Yeah, maybe. I. The thing is, I mean, again, like I'm not on the training ground, so I, I, I don't know that stuff about Xhaka. And I, I'm fully prepared to believe that he's exemplary on the training ground, et cetera, et cetera. And he comes across as like a, as a nice enough man um, and everything else. But I, I dispute this kind of um, this dichotomy. No, I don't dispute the dichotomy. I dispute. <laughs> OK, I, I was going to say why that he's. <laughs> a good leader because more than anyone in our squad with the exception of uh, Mustafi, nobody blows up as badly under pressure um, as Granite Xhaka. Nobody loses their tiny little fucking mind quite like Granite Xhaka does. That's not leadership. That is the opposite of leadership. You know, if you ask, I, I don't know, maybe, um, you know, maybe like you allude to, maybe this is because I'm older than everyone in the Arsenal team and have a different opinion of what constitutes leadership. But to me, that's the opposite of leadership. Like the thing I want from a leader is grace under fire. I want someone who's calm when those bullets start flying, someone who makes good decisions, who keeps their head. That like as I'm reeling those things off, does the name that go on like does the name Granite Xhaka ring around your head? I, I bet it fucking doesn't. So to me, I think he's a 
piss poor leader i think he's i awful agree but but as a leader <laughs> but but here's what i would say and this is the difference right when you're when you're a kid you need someone to tell you to get up and get to school on time or make your bed yeah, yeah. or finish your peas when you're a grown-up you just want people around you who are effective and do their job yeah. and are competent yeah. you don't need someone to tell you to get to work on time because <clears throat> you're just not going to do it regardless but like i guess that's why i asked the question is that like I don't think Obama Yang needs someone to collect the fine when he's late to a meeting. That's not going to make him look up to Granite Shacka. He doesn't need someone no, to no. be a big voice in the dressing room. He's a fucking professional. He knows how to go out there, do his job, and score goals. I think the senior players consider leadership a competent professional who doesn't go out and chuck in goals at the other end. I mean, Obama Yang even made some comment, right, in the press about how we're just kind of throwing goals in our own net. And it, it yeah, added yeah. a ring of frustration about it. So I think that there is a schism there and that I do think the younger players might need more of that parental yeah, yeah. figure, so to speak, as a leader. Possibly. And maybe Shaka provides that around the training ground. But I think yeah. it's got to be hugely frustrating for the experienced professionals. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, uh, you know, like to, to, I guess, to build on my uh, captaincy is not important uh, point because leadership is, but captaincy isn't. The, like the most overrated Arsenal captain of all time is Patrick Vieira. Patrick Vieira, for me, wasn't a great captain per se. He was a phenomenal player. I didn't actually see an awful lot of leadership in him, like not not in the outward sense. Which but it obviously, was a team you know, full of grown-ups, you know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like he was. That was primus inter paris. That was just. This, you know, this is a guy who turns up, does his job to the best of his ability every single week, week in, week out, season in, season out. Uh, he's the kind of symbol of the team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He obviously has a lot of respect. But, you know, a team with Sol Campbell, Ashley Cole, Thierry Henry, Dennis Bergkamp, Robert Perez, Jens Lehmann, Lauren, like... Gilberto, that, that's a team that doesn't need a captain. That is a team full of captains. That what Patrick Vieira played in is the perfect example of shared leadership. And if you were, you know, if you took the Invincibles squad and you took this five captains principle, that would be immensely difficult to shave that down to five. That would be really difficult. Mm. Um, you know, you'd be drawing lots. You'd be, you'd be, it'd be like, I don't know. It'd be like putting together like your team of the season or something. It would just, it would take you forever uh, whittling it all down. Well, And you know, that makes an interesting point too, because when you name one captain in a squad of whatever it is, 26 players or whatever, there's 25 players who aren't named. They're not really going to care that much. But the danger with five captains is it's kind of like if they name an employee of the year at a company of 200 people. All right. I didn't get it. Neither did 198 other people. But if they name mm. 25 employees of the year, <laughs> you know, and, and I didn't get it, I might be a little more concerned. So, I mean, do you think the downside to the five captains thing is it, it's a bigger group to not be included in if you're one of the ones that was left out. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But I, I do think I was, I was listening to the Ask Cast today and, and James Bench talking to Andrew. And actually, he made quite a good point that um, maybe as a counterbalance to that, by having more of these places up for grabs, there's kind of more to play for. Um, so, you know, guys like Abami, like... Probably in July, Abamyang wouldn't have been in a lot of people's, you know, captaincy group, as it were, the five captains. Five or six games later, quite a lot of people want him to be the outright captain. Like that's that's a a swift escalation um, of kind of how he's regarded, like as a as a senior figure and as a leader in the team. So you know, you could say by having more places to play for, that gives people, you know, that gives players like you know, something to go for, I guess. So maybe that's that's a bit of a counterbalance. Um, also, I mean, I, I think ideally, like if you were going to name five, you'd almost want them from different areas of the squad. So you have your figurehead and then maybe you have one of the young players. In, in this case, it looks like it's Bellerin. Which is awesome, you know, by the way. We haven't mentioned that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. that's awesome. He, he belongs in there yeah. and I'm glad he is. Yeah, absolutely. And important and probably, important to get an Englishman into the group. Yeah, yes, uh, a Cockney, no less. <laughs> North London lad. Um, but also, I think you probably want them in different areas of the team. So, yeah, we've got a defender in there in Bellerin. We've got a defensive midfielder in there. We've got a couple of forwards. Um, we've got um, someone on the bench um, all the time as well, like, you know, dishing out the drinks in Mesut Ozil. That's, that's great. Um, 
but it, so like I, I think having them from I guess a cross section of the squad is is like, like I'm I'm not at all opposed to the whole like five captains thing I like like I say I don't really care one five ten a million I, I really don't care um, I, I think it's fine I, I think it's all a bit of a non-issue it's just there's a couple of things in there that the manager has kind of made an issue of not least and the most avoidable of all is is just the delay um, yeah yeah this this could have been done a month a month and like six weeks ago i think quite easily i i think look if you are more forgiving and more charitable towards emery this is an absolute nothing this is a nothing. This is who a who cares move on. If the team was playing great and winning, again, who cares move yep. on. I think yep. if you are inclined to have questions and concerns about Emery, as I do, I am able to look at this and say it is just another little data point that from a decisiveness standpoint, from a conviction standpoint, from an ideology standpoint, from a control of the dressing room standpoint, there are potential issues with this guy at a very big club. Not being able to just make this call right away, not being able to just do it on his own, on on his own decision making, his own authority, what that transmits to the group, and and why this got pushed out again. If he had just done it at the beginning of the season, we wouldn't be talking about it. So I agree with you; the timing of it is weird. But again, your mileage will vary based on your your biases, and that's always the yeah. case. Look, let's take. So, a, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, last thought. I was I was just going to say, just to wrap it up. Like I said at the beginning, this is something you can only get wrong. You can't get it right. Yep, that's a- absolutely well said, and and only matters to teams that aren't winning because teams that are winning, whatever you did, is absolutely right. So, uh, we'll take a break to tell you about uh, a young up and coming website that you probably never heard of but that you're going to want to find out about we'll bring clive in we'll talk about the forest game which is great because that's actually going to be a fun conversation and then we will all predict a massive glorious victory at old trafford so stay with us we'll be back be back with more right after this okay it's time to tell you about the athletic the new home of football writing and a world-class sports website you can get the athletic for half off and a month trial right now if you go to theathletic.com forward slash arsenal vision you'll help the pod And of course, you'll help The Athletic too, but that's a good thing because you will be at the new home of football getting world-class writing and the best coverage of Arsenal from writers like Amy Lawrence, whom we love, has been on the pod, David Ornstein, James McNicholas, also known as Gunnerblog, myself, but don't let that hold you back. The coverage of sports is unrivaled and there's no advertising to get in the way, no clickbait, they're not chasing ad revenue, they're just trying to write great in-depth articles. They've broken some incredible news. They've had some incredible interviews. Loved the article about the Eddie and Ketty load to Leeds and how that came about. So there's a lot to like there. Try it out. It's a month free. And then if you stick with it, it's $2.50 a month. That's it. So you can go to theathletic.com forward slash Arsenal Vision and try it now. See what all the buzz is about. Go sign up now. Theathletic.com forward slash Arsenal Vision. Okay, we're back, and now the pod is going to get good because we have Clive on, and he is on Twitter at Clive PAFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. Welcome, my friend. I'm glad that the traffic abated uh, enough that you could be here, um, and now that we have you on, that means we have to turn to cheerier topics, and that is the League Cup. I have to say, guys, this this kind of was reminiscent of the glory days of the League Cup when Chips Vela was, was banging in goals, chipping them over goalkeepers. It was really enjoyable. Clive... <clears throat> I I haven't enjoyed watching us under Emery, I don't think, as much as I did in this game. Obviously, the standard caveats apply. I thought Forrest were terrible. They had no attacking impetus. And I think that makes it difficult to evaluate the defenders in particular. But let's just start with the ability to possess the ball, keep it in the attacking half, and put pressure on the defenders. How much did you enjoy this performance from that standpoint? I think um, the the main thing was, I mean, we moved the game to help Forest out. I think I got a game against Stoke. I think tonight, Friday night. So I think I also did a good thing by moving the game so they could prepare for that. So we obviously made a number of changes, I think eleven changes. And and I know what you're talking about here about the old days of uh, Vela and Lupoli and all these young players that we uh, raised to the sky that didn't that didn't quite make it. But I think this game was a bit more significant because of the players that are on the pitch that are returning. And in this scenario where we we were looking at young talent below a very good first team, in this scenario we're looking at young talent, some of them have an absolute clear pathway to the match day squad, if not the first 11. And we can all sort of see that. And um, I think this made this game more significant 
based on what we were seeing. You know, players, obviously the, the first team, more established players are holding Bellerin and obviously the first time we get to see Kieran Tierney. But we're really looking at real competition with Saka, Nelson. I know Smith Rowe was unfortunate, but these are real, real players that are going to play. So it's, it's not like a situation where before where we were a bit excited and we hoped they were playing. These guys are going to play and there's opportunity for them to play right the way up until January, the FA Cup time, the Christmas period. There is significant opportunity for minutes for these players. So I felt it had a far greater significance than some of the times we've seen it previously, just because of the depth of the squad where it is right now, the average age of the squad, and the pathways that have been cleared out. I think it was a fantastic evening for spying and looking and trying to project forward to how we could play with the when the real team arrives, which is not here yet, but it's not too far away. Yeah, yeah, well said. Well, I mean, I I kind of want to put to the back of the Forest conversation the, the Tierney Bellerin holding thing. Um, Tim, I want to talk to you about Martinelli first. You know, mm. we sent Eddie and Kedia out on loan. There was hemming and hawing about whether we actually had a backup striker beyond uh, Lacazette and Aubameyang and who it could be. And I have to admit, I didn't look at Martinelli and see future number nine. But you may look at Sergio Aguero and not see that either. This is a guy who's just a pest around the box. And he finds mm. space and he gets in front of his man. And that, that header that he scores is just great center forward play. You know, you, you, we're yeah. learning, especially from Aubameyang, that to be a great center forward, what you need more than anything is just movement and understanding of where the, the space is and where the ball can come to you. And he seems to have that. So, you know, I know when we talked about Martinelli when we first signed him up, your feeling was that he might need some time, and, and he, of course, still does need some time. Mm. But having seen him in this game, does your evaluation of him lead you to thinking that maybe there is a center forward in there? Yeah, yeah, there very well could be. I, I think what he's done with this performance is he's probably earned the right to start up front in the next Europa League game. Because, you know, we didn't want to take that gamble in Frankfurt, which I kind of understand. But now we've got Liège, you know, three days after United away. He's 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 earned the right, I think, to start that game up front so that we can sit Aubameyang down again. Um, which, which, you know, in these games is like the best possible outcome um, that you can have is you know similar to Sacco. Sacco played well in Frankfurt, started the next league game, and I I think that's that's kind of what you want to build the trust. And you know as Clive says, there are games coming up where we can kind of afford to do that as well. I I thought I thought his performance was really interesting because he hasn't his kind of history. It's largely. So I don't think his position is really really set yet. He has played largely on the left, but. Um, Jack Lang did uh, a really good piece on him actually in in the Athletic uh, this week, talking about how, you know, he's been preparing for this for a long time, uh, Martinelli, and everything him and his dad have done, they've been like they've been mapping this path out for him since he was 13 or 14, and you know his dad got him a nutritionist when he was 15 and a personal trainer and all of that. They've been, um, and and this this actually happens quite a lot in Brazil, by the way. Um, you know, people see good young footballers really as assets um, because because they know they can sell them to Europe for good money. They know that when you say a player's Brazilian, that adds another couple of million. Um, it's like a brand being Brazilian. So, mm. but they've they've been they've been on this path for a little while, and he had a chance to go to Man United, and they they didn't quite do it. Um, so they've been very careful with how he's been managed. But uh, one of the things, sorry, in, in Jack's piece was that he hasn't really, he, like, he's played all across the forward line. He's played as a number 10. Um, and that, that really he's he's more of an all-round forward. Um, and again, this is quite typical of young Brazilian talent because what they're doing in Brazil, actually often to the detriment of their national team, is they they don't want to create specialists. They want all rounders because what they're trying to do, it's almost like the, the players come for like a being factory made. They want, mm. they want players that appeal to the European market. That's what they want. And that's why for a long time, Brazil couldn't find a proper centre forward anymore because no one plays with proper centre forwards and why they haven't had like a proper number eight for over a decade because they've been creating all of these all rounders. But uh, Martinelli's, performance at the risk of um 
you know, pigeonholing him just because of nationality. It had a bit of a Firmino quality to me. Like he was rarely kind of, you know, standing on the penalty spot um, or anything like that, but he was just pulling off nicely into those little channels. And I think when you had, you know, it was an, I think it was a nicely balanced front three for him as well. Cause you had, you know, you had um, Nelson on the left kind of coming in. So him and he was going into that left channel and him and Nelson were getting close together. And then you've got Smith Rowe on the right. And I, I think it had quite a nice balance to it. And that balance continued when Saka came on and you've got Saka, you've got Nelson next to Martinelli. They're all quite front foot, um, like those kind of half spaces. And, and, and I think I think it all worked really well. Um, as a kind of network. I think, for example, if you'd had Iwobi and Mkhitaryan either side of Martinelli, it might have been a different performance because when you have players like that who aren't as end product heavy, then, you know, he is standing on the penalty spot waiting for the ball, whereas there was a bit a bit more fluidity, a bit more movement about this front line. So I think it was as much about what was around him. But what's um, what's really encouraging about that is he had teenagers around him. You know, we weren't, you know, we're not talking about super experienced players who guided him through this. That was a young, very very green front line, um, mm. and and I think I think they all interacted very very well, and uh, and, and I think that's hugely promising for all of them. Yeah, I totally agree. And I mean, I'd I'd take a Firmino, I'd take a uh, Cunaguero. I mean. I'd, t- I'd take a hybrid of the two would be fine with me, but it is really encouraging because at a minimum, you're right. I think he has to start up front uh, in the Europa League. We have what it, we're home to mm-hmm. standard. Who is it? Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so standard Liege, yeah. I mean, y- you got to give him that opportunity. Clive, I, I, I want to ask you a question. I sometimes go over the top with my opinions, my conclusions, my analysis. So I like that you can bring me back down to earth. But I feel like it's at least fair for me to say that Callum Chambers is the best player at the club. Is that is that right? I think uh, I think you're absolutely correct. I know you've okay, got, or I know you've already discussed the captaincy, but maybe we missed a player there. We should be in that list. I think. Uh, but but, well, but do, you, do you need to give a guy a captaincy who's winning the Ballon d'Or? Like I feel like that's that's <laughs> overkill. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Joking aside, he's. Um, I I just I just um, enjoying the fact that he's letting everyone know he wants to play football, and he's prepared to do everything he possibly can to do it. And he doesn't mind where it is. I want to play. I've been away, and I'm coming back, and I want to play. And it seems as though the manager. Was, I think the Saka selection the other day was really significant. He played well, did enough, scored, assisted he played and I think that's a brilliant sign to everybody else I thought in the in the Forest game I thought Nelson absolutely bust the gut to let everyone know I want to play too right and now now we've got Chambers doing exactly the same thing and this is great because now they're putting pressure on the people that were previously all in our first 11s and untouchable and the moment they make an, an error we're thinking well we want to see a change and and we're not thinking there's going to be a talent deficit. We're thinking this guy's looking to play. Let's see what he looks like. And uh, and Chambers falls into that category. Um, we all know he's got a limit pace wide in wide areas, but the way he's counteracting that is by being very active in his movement and very forceful. And he's forcing people back, and he's sneaking up on the back post. He's forcing people to mark him. Right, so, but we know there's a limit there on speed. But he's, you know, what he does very cleverly is he focuses on the entry pass. It gets very, very tight, and he, as soon as he wins it, he springs off and says, "You got to follow me." So he's he's doing really well, in my opinion. He could easily play right centre half. I think his favourite position was right centre half in the three. He's quoted that before, and he spent many times as a youth player as a holding midfield player, and obviously played there most of the last season because he did have problems at centre half in a team that was under significant pressure, and then he went into holding midfield and became the player of the season for Fulham. So I like the fact that he he is he is flexible, and he wants to and he wants to demonstrate that. I just want to go back to Tim's point about the academy system, maybe or young players being built in um in Brazil. That's something that we do very much over here under the EPPP. We are building all rounders, and they, the, the way the, pro, the coaching works, it tends to build a lot of midfielders, and because the midfielder skill, depending on your body type, could actually go backwards or forward, and so you're building these sort of rounded players. 
that potentially can end up, you know, you might have a centre midfielder end up as a fullback, depending on how they grow, depending on how they develop. So you build the skill sets to be rounded, and then you find your position quite late. I think Martinelli is a great example of that. I think Firmino is one description of him. And someone mentioned to me on online that he looks a bit like Son. And I thought, that's, that's another good description. Just a fast, raiding, sprinty, pressing forward player that can play left or right, support or forward. But actually, Son has played centre forward on occasion. I thought, that's a great shout. With Arsenal's need, we're thinking, oh, you could be a Firmino, Lacazette, backfield, because we need him to be for next week. But the fact he could probably do all of the jobs, is which is, is great at 18. Yeah. And eventually, he'll develop into his position. Whereas Chambers now... If there's a real debate to what he is, I really think he could do a couple of jobs pretty well. But I do think he could go quite far if in the right team, in the right system, if he was to play a holding midfield role. I mean, Eric Dyer went to the World Cup, for God's sake, and I think he's way <laughs> better than him. And I've always so said am it. I. <laughs> He's way better than him. He's got more ability on the ball. He's just as physical defending. He's just as quick. He can actually manipulate the football. And Eric Dyer scored a winning penalty in an England knockout game and wore the armband. So it just shows you how far you can go when you're in the right system with the right role. And I think, you know, it's Chambers. I know there's some, somebody in the way in that role at the moment. <laughs> I missed that section. But Chambers could easily do that job. Mm. And I feel do it to a decent top six level on the right occasion. Yeah, I mean, if the laws allowed us to take Shaq out of the team, it would be an interesting way to go, but unfortunately, that's not how they're written. Um, I, I think, look, the volley cross he hit for the assist was sensational. The technique on the ball he showed for his goal against Villa is sensational, and I, I think it's a classic example how alone can work out so well when it's done properly. He starred for a terrible team, but there's something to be said for that. You know, I think back to the day when his career looked like it was ended by Jefferson Montero at Swansea, and his head was down. I mean, you could see that was a player stripped of all confidence and self-belief. And you see it with Maitland-Niles. Maitland-Niles hangs his head when he makes a mistake. It really affects him. You know, even Alex Awobi had, had some of that in his game. And Chambers goes to a place where you're losing a lot and you're shipping a lot of goals and things aren't going your way. And you just got to keep your head up and stay with your job and, and stick to it. And he did. And he was their player of the season. And now he comes back a, a little bigger bodied, a little stronger. But I think with a little more resilience, you know, obviously when we get into psych, pop psychology, you never know. But he just looks like a player who, who's willing to go out there and show that he belongs and not be worried about making a mistake. And I, I think that makes such a big difference for a young player. And he, he, he's been a delight to see. And I think, look, he is going to play because I think he's going to play right back over Maitland-Niles going forward. I, I think Emery has to make that choice. I think he's put himself in the frame to play at center back. And maybe even be an emergency left back. So we'll we'll see how that works. But it's great for him, Tim. I think um, the big big stories in this game naturally are going to be the return of Bellerin, Tierney, and Rob Holding. And I don't think we need to talk about them all individually. Although the Tierney one might be a little more interesting because it's our first real look at him. I struggle with this game as an evaluation for them because. I have never, I literally cannot remember an Arsenal team coming under less pressure, even in some of the <laughs> yeah. easiest Europa League games. And by the way, you know, just as an aside, I wonder if the last 30 minutes against Villa and this game could somehow possibly be a message to Emery because we were under no pressure because they had no time to put us under pressure. They were all mm. hands to the pump defending. Villa were for the last 30 minutes and and Forrest were for the entire game. And when you look at Colchester and, and Rochdale and what they did in their League Cup games, you know, if you don't put those teams under pressure, they still can't hurt you. And we didn't give Forrest the yeah. opportunity to do that. So maybe that's giving Emery something to consider. But as far as evaluating the, those three defenders I mentioned, can you take anything away from a game where they did basically no defending? But probably not on the basis of this game alone. Um, and sorry, just to back up your point as well. Last year, everyone will have forgotten it because it was a terrible game and it was the Carabao Cup. But last year, I think we played um, Blackpool in the third round and we won one yeah. nil. And same deal. We went one nil up in the first half and you thought, OK, easy street. And we ended up winning one nil. <laughs> and that was the end of it. Um, so, yeah, just to kind of uh, back up your point there. I, I don't think there is... I mean, maybe we can from Tierney because it's our first piece of um, data, shall we say, on him. It's the first information we have. And he looked like everything we've been told he is. So um, that's positive. I 
I think, um, and, and, you know, withholding as well, I, 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 f- I found this really interesting and I wrote a bit of a piece on it this week because it, it made me think, so what, what's going wrong with Luis and Socrates? And I understand like, you know, the future of that defense is there. Like you can see it, it's, it's holding, it's Bellerin, it's, um, Tierney and it's probably Saliba and, you know, Callum Chambers, uh, I, I've always thought Callum Chambers can have um, have a decent future in there as, as a as a decent utility man. Albeit, I think his last two performances are being slightly overrated because of the um, the offensive output um, in them. He still made quite a big defensive error against Villa, but that's by the by. Um, I, I I think my my issue why the the conclusion i came to when i've been watching back some highlights and thinking about the situations that louise and socrates have been in i mean my read of it is that emery just doesn't trust maitland niles and kolasinac's defenders he's now got pepe as a a wide player ahead of one of them and he's really really nervous with, with some justification about the defending of wide areas and so that's where the midfield is going all the time that's where sabios is that's where Torreira is that's where genduzzi is they're out wide trying to plug where Emery sees gaps. And as a result, we're leaving this massive smoking crater in the middle and we're just leaving Granite Xhaka guarding it, which, which is also exposing Granite Xhaka um, as well. So I, I feel like the Definitely. two centre-halves and the defensive midfielder are being exposed. And my hope is that when Bellerin and Tierney are fit and playing, that that will become less of an issue. And what was our best midfield performance of the season? For me, by far and away against Burnley. And what did you see against Burnley? The three central midfielders really tight together, really, because, you know, Burnley played like a 4-4-2. Yeah, and guess who couldn't play in the Burnley game? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that's 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 another point. But they were nice and tight and they were close together and they were giving each other out balls and they were doing that one touch getting out of getting out of trouble stuff. Burnley tried to press up on us and on the goal kicks with some success, but we had a bit more luck there because we had like we had a closer midfield unit and they weren't being sucked out to the touch lines all the time and that that's my big hope um i think I, I i think eventually once he's fit and everything like that hold you know holding will come into the team when he's ready i think we signed david Luiz. he's 32 he's on a two-year contract that's not a long-term signing socrates was not a long-term signing they were necessary short-term signings so we can already see the sight lines there we already know what the plan is at the very least whether it actually works like that we'll see but you, you can see the futures there. You can absolutely see it. And that's credit again to, you know, the, the, the top brass at the club, to the executive team who've, who are doing the squad planning and, and they've got a plan you can follow. Yeah. Um, but at the moment, I think we're being a bit hampered by the fact that Emery doesn't quite trust Pepe defensively. And he doesn't try, you know, cause look what he was doing last season when he was playing Maitland Niles and Kolasinac, he was playing a back three, and he's ditched that this year, but he's still trying to compensate for what he sees as well. Whether he sees that, I think a lot of people see it as as kind of two fullbacks who aren't defensively quite as sharp as the first choices there. Yeah, you know what's interesting too. I, I think maybe there's a little bit of a pendulum issue here with Emery and and tactics. You talk about the gaping hole in the center of the pitch. Tim, his entire time at Arsenal, the one thing he's always done is put a box in midfield or put a column of players in the center of the pitch, been compact centrally, and said, if you're going to beat us, get it wide. That's the space we're going to give you. You're not going to attack us through the middle. And he got absolutely crushed in the media for the way he played Liverpool in terms of the space he gave them on the wings and how much space we allowed for the fullbacks to get into position of putting crosses and things. And since that time, what have we done? We've split our midfielders out to support the wide players and created a crater in the middle of the pitch. And it almost feels like an overreaction to our vulnerability on the flanks that now we are being vulnerable for the first time, really, I think, under Emery, significantly vulnerable over an extended period of time through the middle of the pitch, which is kind of weird. But you couldn't ask for a better feel-good factor than this game in the sense of, um, you know, Tierney gets back and looks good, and Bellerin gets an assist within about a minute of being on the pitch. Holding comes back and gets a goal. Nelson, who I think really needs one, gets a goal. Martinelli looks like he's a center forward. So there's a lot of good takeaways from this. Uh, Clive, just real quick, your thoughts on Tierney. There was a lot of push and run here. He had a lot of space to just kind of 
get the ball and drive forward. I think that's great. I'm curious if that's something that he'll be able to do when there's less space in the Premier League. But do you have any early thoughts on him? I mean, the one big difference I would say is the crossing at least looked a little more encouraging. Yeah, he looks uh, very exciting. I think um, it's been. It's, I've been watching him a lot in, in the in, in the preseason videos and watching him come back. He looks like a supreme athlete. He's a natural athlete. Very very sprinty, very aggressive, very bouncy. And it's just his ability to, one, the one thing that sprinters have, some some people have speed, but he has change of speed. Yeah. And his abili- it's the ability to, what what kills you with speed is his ability to stop and start. And quick players that can stop quickly, adjust their feet, and then start again. You know, he can do it offensively, he can do it defensively. He absolutely knows exactly where to stand, when to tuck in, when to drive out of his hole. It was very interesting. The two boys, they're not they are not super fit yet. Obviously, Tini looks a lot closer than Bellerin due to the, the time he's been out. But their transition switch, as soon as they get it, it's like, bang, they're like, gone. You see what I mean? They're like... We're now dictating how this game's going to be played. I sometimes feel with our wing backs, when they get it high, they switch on. When they get it in midfield, lower down, they stand in. They don't they don't progress it. They don't feel comfortable in those deep positions near their box. So they stand in holes. Whereas good fullbacks, they get it, pop, drive. They drive out of holes on the secure possession, get it back, and they force teams back. And I think we've been a we've been a victim of that of being passive in fullback areas and not driving out of our holes quick enough and because of that people take positions from that right so the, your centre halves then drop in and I, I read Tim's article I thought that was a really interesting view and I agree with almost all of it apart from one thing I think also our centre mids have a tendency to want to receive the ball in wide areas and then drive back into the centre and I think that's great except for if it doesn't get there do you see what I mean? And mm-hmm. we're in situations yeah. where we're open. And so the ability to cover that middle, I think it's partly because of our fullbacks are not where they should be. If they're pushing up higher, our, it squeezes in our centre mids. And partly because of their frailties. And partly because well, we've watched Gwen do do all the time. Receive it on the left and drive into where his starting position was from. And then deliver a pass. And he's making a trick of that, which is all well and good long as you control possession. So again, going back to what we saw from Tierney, I thought he looks he looks incredibly promising. And I can't wait to see him against elite players to see if that transmits the same separation, the same speed, the same bounce. His left foot is is unreal, mate. It's absolutely unreal. There's no pompous coming out of the left foot. He's just seeing what his body looks like against Premiership players. Are we seeing the same pace? Are we seeing the same power at that level? And I think, it, again, I haven't overplayed these two fullbacks coming in, but I'm starting to think, oh, hold on a minute. There is a completely new team around the corner, and a lot of it will come from fullbacks. And I know you asked me a question on the last pod earlier about do you think the fullbacks are impacting the centre mid? And I didn't really feel it as much as you did at that period of time because I think there's, there's, there's a number of things happening there, including what Tim wrote, front or front to back distances as well, and the selection as well. But I think you add all of this together, you start to see how much improvement there is in this team ahead. And I think there's massive improvement if we get those players all on the pitch in the right state of health. Yeah, well said. And I mean... It is interesting because back in the heyday of the League Cup, when we had a lot of young players coming through, but we had Champions League, the League Cup was really the only opportunity for them to get playing time. The only upside to the Europa League is it is a chance for these players to really bang on the door and and get that experience, get it at Arsenal, and, and potentially put themselves in the frame to be first-team players more regularly. And I just hope Emery leans into that. He, he has got to use these players again in the Europa League. Uh, you know, not necessarily like holding in Tierney and, and Bellerin, but certainly Martinelli and Nelson and Saka. These guys, you know, they have to play there. Um, let, let's turn our attention to the trip to Old Trafford. And, and Tim, this is a place we just don't win in the Premier League. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it doesn't seem to matter if it's Moyes in chaos or Van Gaal in chaos or Jose Mourinho in chaos. We have been a salve for them, uh, sometimes playing well and getting a bit unlucky and sometimes just shitting our pants and being terrible. I don't think 
they've been in any more chaos than they are here because they may have had more problems with their coach before, but I don't know if they've had more problems with their their squad before. And the team mm. news is encouraging early. Pogba, who hilariously played 90 minutes in the League Cup, apparently had a swollen ankle afterward, didn't come through very well, so there's concerns about him. Um, Anthony Martial does not look like he's going to be back. Rashford is out. This is a monster opportunity. I, I just want to get your, first of all, perspective, overall perspective on the situation. How important is it for us to finally, finally, finally get something at Old Trafford given the state of their squad and, and just the, the direction of travel for them? I, I think it's a bellwether game for Unai Emery. Um, he, he's not quite felt the full level of disgruntlement from from the Arsenal fans yet. I think there are a few reasons for that. You know, last season when we collapsed in the league, there was the Europa League final still. So, you know, it was on the tab, so to speak. And then the Europa League final was so bad that nobody even wanted to think about Arsenal anymore. So again, there was a bit of a reprieve. And then there was a fairly good summer of transfer business. So there was a reprieve. And so like, but there's some resentment on that tab. It just hasn't fully surfaced yet. I think if Arsenal don't win this game, then we'll start to see it. Um, we'll we'll start to see it on a fairly regular basis um, as well. Uh, this is, you know, and the thing is, for, for all the stuff that you've just said, because this is such a golden opportunity to finally bury that hoodoo, I mean, that unfortunately, that puts even more pressure on the players because they're, they're not quite bookmakers' favourites. United are still favourites of the bookmakers. But I think this is the closest the odds have ever been um, for Arsenal away at United. And think about some of the Arsenal teams that have been to Old Trafford down the years. And I think I'm right in saying this is the closest. So one of our, like, one of our worst teams, you know, for like 20-odd years um, is... is you know, not quite favourites, but close to it. So I think Emery needs a victory here. Um, maybe even more than a performance. Like, even if it was... I think he'd get away if we got, like, a fairly unimpressive 1-0 or 2-1. Obviously, <clears throat> I think people will be looking for performance and style and stuff like that. But I, I do get the sense that with the pressure that is on Arsenal to win this... I, I get the sense that they've really just got to get this over the line um, because, you know, as you say, United are in are in complete disarray. And actually, my my concern when I was watching the score come through for United against Rochdale, I thought if United lose this, um, I didn't want United to lose because I thought they might sack Solskjaer <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. they did. And I thought, no, 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 no. Let's 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 just calm down. Let's just have him for one more game, um, maybe. But um, I, I, I'm not stupid enough to like feel cocky about this. I think there is a big psychological um, impasse that Arsenal have to break on Monday night. I mean, I think they've got four wins in 15. Now, let's be clear. Their underlying metrics in the league are pretty decent. I think they have the best XG allowed in the entire league by some distance. They are they have been very good defensively. They are terrible going forward. All, almost all of their XG, I mean, a huge percentage of it is from the penalty spot. They don't have anyone to score the goals. You know, I, I'm I'm... Clive, I'm reminded of a time we went to Old Trafford and Alec Ferguson played eight defenders and beat us comfortably. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is now Ferguson. What they have, they try to do to me. <laughs> well, he, here's what I was going to say. I, I'm going to slightly disagree with Tim in one respect. A win where we sit back all game and soak up pressure and then get a 90th minute corner kick where there's like a scramble in the box and we kick it in and we win. I would bite your hand off for it. <clears throat> but... I am at the point with Emery where I'm trying to see signs that he gets it, that he understands the identity of the squad and, and how to get more out of them. This is a United team that doesn't look like it can hurt you too badly, and it certainly looks like a team that we can go out and have a go at. Um, so for you, how important is it that Emery takes the shackles off a little bit here and doesn't have that sort of Liverpool at Anfield approach to this game for you to feel that he, he really gets it, that he understands what's happening here and for us to get a result. You know, I don't think um, Liverpool at Anfield is a unique situation. I don't think we do that at very many grounds. Any other grounds, maybe? Can you think of that approach? I, I just don't see it. City away, so, maybe, um, I don't know. 
maybe he'll do it at City away, but we we tend to do okay there straight in a strange way. I know we don't always win, but the record historically has been quite good, right? So we haven't look well, we haven't beat Manchester United Old Trafford in the league since 2006, and in 2006 I had a six pack, and I don't have one now. Right? That tells you how long ago that was. You have one in I the think, fridge, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, this is some. Every time I I do this to myself. I say, this is the one, this is the one. And when we get there, we have this brain freeze. And it, and it's a club thing. Um, but I do think this is the one. And I think the, the two clubs are directionally in a, in a quite a similar place. They have been, you know, what we're seeing is a result of years of bad decisions in the transfer market, bad contract decisions. And I feel, and bad organisations, basically. And um, Manchester United uh, have spent more money than us while making mistakes. And they almost become a laughing stock. I think we were here about 18 months ago. But since then, we've gone through some change within the club structure. And we're going through change on the pitch. And I feel squad-wise, we're just more advanced in what we're trying to do. We've, we've done the, the by the younger players. And also buying the odd older player just to solidify us. We've done that, and also we've got that we've got that structure behind us, which Manchester United haven't got. And this is why they are going through the pain that we were going through towards the end of Wenger's reign, not seeing a club structure, not seeing anything on the pitch that we can hang on to. So we had a bit of a jump on them on that regard. But to make that really count, you have to win. And you have to show people that you're further on that life cycle. And this opportunity is really, really there for us. Manchester United are in a bad place. They have this game on Monday. They have AZ Altmar on Thursday. And they've got Newcastle away, which historically is a bad game for them because of the history of Newcastle and Manchester United. And if they don't get anything out of those three games, the international break staring at them, and they could be in, they could be in serious, serious mid-table trouble. You know, so for Arsenal now, if we do win this game and then go into standard the age, and then I think we've got Bournemouth at the weekend, then suddenly the international break looks massively different. We get Lacazette back, we have fit fullbacks, we have fit Rob Holding, we have competition and depth, and it just changes. It just changes. So if I'm Emery, I'm going for this game. I think from a fan base, obviously there's a lot of fans that have, have checked out on him. And they, no matter what he does, when the good things happen, it's not him. And when bad things happen, I'm going to question why it could be him. I'm going to point it at him. So there are people in that space, and I'm just going to ignore that and just look at the potential on the football pitch. And in three games' time, we could be looking at a signif- significantly different Arsenal potential if we grab this first opportunity. Because I think Bournemouth will take care of itself. Yeah. And the, and the European game is the European game. So I hope we grab it. We have the players. We are in a better place competition-wise. There's no reason why we can't. It's all down to selection and how we approach the game. And if we play the game and not the stadium and not the badge and just play those players we have a really good chance. Look, I have to admit, I'm with you, except that there is a disconnect here. Let's face it. We look at this team and we see it and we think it's good and we think there's no reason it can't be good and Emery's going to get it right. He must because it's a good team. And then you say, we blew a two-goal lead to rock-bottom Watford and we were trailing at home the newly promoted Villa. And like the reality of who we are and how we play doesn't always tally with the concept we have in our head of who we should be and how we should play. So, no, I, I, so Ellie, can I just come back on that a little sure, bit? I yeah. think I think you make a really good point. And I think this is what the Nottingham Forest game has shown us. I think what we can now start to envisage in our mind is a whole new set of partnerships. I don't think the partnerships we, we've, we've seen, have, they've, they've just not worked. The centre-back partnership, I, I'm really concerned about that. Right, so what's happening between right centre back and right back and and left back? It's not there. We can debate the centre midfield partnership, right? And we've lost our centre forward partnership because the Lacazette's injured, so we've lost the connection there. So we we're just this team of eleven players that are not really glued together by anybody or anything. And I think what we're seeing with these players that are potentially around the corner is an opportunity for new partnerships over the pitch. And I think that's really key. We wait till we get that so we can see that. Because yeah. n- none of us would pick these partnerships. I didn't expect Louise and Socrates to be 
this bad, if I'm honest with you. In our first 11 at the start of the season, we're picking these two based on experience. But they have not worked as a unit. They're playing as individuals and they're just playing for themselves. We know we've got two wing backs in place. You know, we all can disagree and agree on the what should happen in front of the back four. Should it be a double pivot? And, and you know, our newly, our newly named captain, I don't think he's an ever weak player. And he shouldn't be, right? So that needs to be debated. That needs to happen. Those choices need to be made. And what happens ahead in the 10, or we have three in, it's a debate point. And there's nothing solidified partnerships-wise. So we have the names, but we don't have the glue. And we need to sustain some partnerships that we can develop a more cohesive unit going forward. And I think that's what the coach has got to get to particularly by after the international break. There should be no more BS now, no more systemic changes. Choose your players, choose your first team players, choose your partnerships and develop them. And injury allow, we may be able to see them over a longer period of time. So, <clears throat> look, I, I want to be clear about saying I, I am not going to be dogmatic about this, but I every time I want to agree on that point where I'm like... You know, we, we've fallen into this trap, right? Some people have, like, oh, if we just put Torreira at the base instead of Shaq, or, oh, when we just get the center backs back. Like, we didn't get out shot 31-7 to by Watford because the midfield pairing was wrong or the center back pairing was wrong, okay? We didn't score two goals without reply and outshoot the shit out of Villa in the last 20 minutes because we got the center, c- c- central midfield pairings, right? And we didn't outshoot Nottingham Forest, 27 to 5 because the we had exactly the right combination of players. We did it because in those instances, in the last 30 minutes against Villa and for 90 minutes against Forest, we piled the pressure on. 68% possession, 27 shots. Against Watford, we sat, we didn't con- commit enough resources to the attack, and we invited our vulnerabilities to be exploited. And I just think that you know, the notion that if we, oh, if we just take Shaka out and put Torreira in, suddenly we're not a team that gets outshot 31-7 to anymore I'm, is I'm, probably I'm not a fantasy. I'm, no, no, I'm no, not I'm, I'm, I, Clive, I'm not saying you're saying that. There are people, though, that I think are trying to fine-tune the lineup to just fix the things that I'm starting to believe can't possibly be a lineup issue. Arsenal Football Club doesn't get outshot 31-7 to against Watford because we just didn't quite get the lineup right. So... So, Tim, I think, let's pick the lineup, <laughs> but but I, I think the mindset, you know, if I have a hope in the world about these last two games, it's that Emery can look at the 90 against Forest and look at the last 30 against Villa and say, I like watching us do that. That looks <laughs> a lot like our identity. That looks a lot like the way this team is constructed. And maybe the the nervousness about doing that will abate, given that he's seen how much actually less pressure is was on us in those moments so we we don't we won't know we won't know for the next few games if emery starts to have a change of heart about how he approaches football i mean he's been in the game a long time the idea that he's just suddenly going to see the game differently I don't know. Maybe having fullbacks who he trusts more will allow him to do that, as Clive alluded to. And I do think that that is a very valid point. But for you, who, who's starting in this game? Let's 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 get to it. I mean, we know Aubameyang, we know Leno. The rest of it, I think, uh, and probably Pepe. The rest of it is probably up for grabs. Who do you have? Uh, so what I think Emery will do, I think he'll go with Leno. I think he's going to keep he's going to play Chambers at right back instead of Maitland Niles, but I think he'll stay with Luis and Socrates. Um, I've got a feeling he's going to start Tierney because there'll have been six days uh, between the Forest game. I've got a feeling he's going to do that. He'll play Xhaka because he always plays Xhaka. He'll play Genduzi, Um and I think he'll play Torreira. As well, I think he'll go with that midfield three because I think he'll go with Pepe in one of the wide positions, um, Abamyang up front, and so that leaves the last position, which hmm, hmm. Sakura hmm. Nelson, Sakura Nelson. Yeah, yeah. I think he might. I think he hmm. could. Could he be considering Mart- Martinelli on the back brains. of uh, back well, his performance? Tim's brains going. <laughs> He could go with Ozil um, and slightly mm-hmm. tweak the formation or play Ozil in, in one of... The only thing is, I think if he's going to play Ozil wide, I think he'd prefer to play him from the right than the left, and that's Pepe's role. So 
Maybe do you think the fact that he hates a... his guts will influence that decision? <laughs> <laughs> he, he might be inclined to go with a four diamond two again um, with Ozil number 10 and Pepe and Aubameyang kind of up front. I wouldn't be that surprised if he did that. Yeah, I think he'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Clive, your call. Yeah, I, I, I totally hear Tim and I, I, it wouldn't surprise me. And I, I just don't think it, it works with the, the, the midfielders on the wide tips that we have at the moment. I just don't think it works. So um, I hope he goes three in and three up or a four, two, three, one. It didn't bother me either way um, because it ends up being a four, three, three anyway. So um, I, I go with the, the same back four, although it wouldn't surprise if it was me, I would keep Maitland Knowles, you know, though I think he needs a break. I think he looks shot at the moment. But only because I'm looking at Daniel James and the fact he's the fastest thing since since you know, since history. He's very, very quick and I think it'll be uh, a bit of a, a tough one for Is he fit? Chambers. Yeah, he's fit. I think it would be tough on Chambers, but you know what? He's young and inexperienced, and and Chambers could drive him back, right? So I I would just match it up. But I actually would still play Chambers. I play him at right centre half. I don't think Socrates is playing is playing well, and I'd like to I'd like to see a change up there. I'd like to see Chambers do that role. He drops off very quickly, and I think he he can take away the pace of James if if Maitland Niles gets run. But that's fifty fifty. I don't mind either way which it goes. I would keep the three in centre mid. I I would have. Torreira, Shaka, and um, and Gwendouzi. I I I have a Gwendouzi slightly freer. I give him a freer role to get on the ball and play. Uh, and I would play Saka actually. Um, I just think he he has the power and body power to drive. I think he works back defensively, so he's more two way. And I think he'll do a lot of work on that side and allow Pepe to be slightly lazier on the right-hand side and have um, a Bamiyang up front. And, and But to be honest, it's, it wouldn't bother me. I'd, I'd go exactly the same team as Tim as well, but I would have Ozil from the left-hand side. And I would say create from there, but come in, but get yourself back out there on that on that left-hand side when we're defending. And, you know, that would be a good vote of confidence for him. I know lots of people want to see him, but if we're honest, you know, Ozil's next chance of playing where I would play him would be in the home European game where he can be a completely free man, do his thing. When we take us away from home, let's be honest, it's a nice idea, but we end up playing with 10 men defensively. And I don't think if we want to beat Manchester United, we need to be going there with 10 men off the ball. We need to go there with people going to outwork them, press them, prick their confidence and take the game back to them. We can't do that if we have got people jogging back into holes. Because what happened earlier is exactly what you don't want to see, which is a deep team defending and playing on the break, which is um, not what no, we should be doing. No, I, I agree with that. I'd push the midfield and the attackers up, and I'd drop the defend the, the center backs back just a little bit because they they don't have any. They can't play through midfield. They'll they'll probably try to play long if we do that. And at that point, they don't really have players in space that can hurt you very much. I mean, Lingard might be might be starting for them up front. That's how they finished their last Premier League game, and and they yeah. don't have Martial, and they don't have Rashford. So I, I just don't see this being a team that can hurt you. What I do see is you're not going to get any joy off Juan Bissaka. Defensively, he's phenomenal. Um, so maybe you could play a 4-3-3 with Ozil on the left, drifting in more centrally to play in the runs of Pepe and Aubameyang between, uh, you know, between the center backs or, or inside the right channel because... I don't think you're going to get a lot of joy off Juan Bissaka, regardless of who you put in there. And I think even if you try to do the whole thing we always do, which is play down the left wing and left half space and try to put in crosses, I think you're playing into the strength of their defense. So I don't know that I would do that. Um, regardless, look, would I like to see Shaka dropped? I would. I think Ceballos and Ganduzi are a great double pivot. I think Ganduzi needs a partner right next to him. I think, uh, sorry, Ceballos needs a partner right next to him. I think Ganduzi can provide that. Um, I, I don't know that you need Torreira here because, I, again, I don't see them being able to play their way through midfield very effectively. He can't play Ceballos at 10. I just hope if he picks a 4 2 three, one, or even a 4-diamond-2, which I hope he won't, you can't play Ceballos at 10. That is not a position for him. Um, I mean, I, I he could pick Willock to carry the ball through midfield. You give him a little more of that drive, and, and that's something he could do. Again, look, the, the, the position on the pitch I think he's most struggled to solve is the 10. And... There's a guy who wears that number for us who's pretty talented. I, I wouldn't mind seeing him start. I just don't think he will. I agree. Uh, let's just do predictions and get out of here because we're running pretty long at this point. Uh, Tim, what do you got? 2-1 Arsenal. Big call. Clive? Yeah, I'm going to... I think because Tim stole that one, I'll go 1-0 Arsenal. I think we're just going to edge it this time. You know, I just think we are. So, yeah. 
we're going to concede to someone terrible, probably Lingard, and do some Millie Rock bullshit. So <laughs> I guess the question is, can we score? And they've been excellent defensively. Um, so they'll get a penalty, which they'll put away. Um, and we will score, and it'll be 1-1, and it'll be deeply disappointing, unfortunately. Um uh, if we win, if we win midfield, we win the game. They've got well, you no can't forwards. lose midfield to them. <laughs> they don't yeah. have a midfield. It, Is Fred going to dominate uh, us? If Fred dominates us, I quit. <laughs> I don't think they have more midfielders available. You know, closer to their first choice. They don't have Pogba even though, from the sounds even, of things. Uh, even if we don't rate them, they have more midfielders available. We just got to disconnect them from their front men. If we do that, right. then we can play the game we want, and I think we can test them at the back. But we can't concede because they have got the ability to um, to close up the shops a little bit with Maguire, etc. So it's very important we get that first goal and see what happens. Yeah, if Pogba plays, that's always a game changer. I mean, he he is he is one of those types of players who, on his day, can totally change the outcome of a game. So I'm I'm hoping he can't make it. Clive's on Twitter at Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thanks, man. Tim's on Twitter at Stoberto. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure as always. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter at Yankee Gunner. Give us a five star review. Write the nastiest things humanly imaginable about Paul. Uh, Scott will be on coming up down the road. Sign up for Patreon because uh, it's fun and it's wonderful and you get lots of good stuff. And then we can talk in the Discord and and it's just great. But if not, if you can't, if you don't want to. We love you, and we appreciate you listening to this regardless. Uh, it is a weekend without football, which sucks, but uh, maybe the Schadenfreude gods will will smile on us and get us some fun results uh, before we go to Old Trafford and win by the amount that I'm about to tell you. So, we love you, and we will talk to you after Arsenal 10, United 0.